Welcome to the 100th episode of the SBC Audio Experience. Today's episode is a previously recorded webinar with SBC lead instructor Bobby Marks and SBC instructor Eric Pincus as your hosts. Tune in as they dive into how teams navigate the trade deadline and host a Q&A with webinar attendees talking all things business of basketball. In this episode, listeners will gain exclusive insights in the world of front office executives during this very special 100th episode. All right, welcome everyone to a Monday night webinar. Um, We are going to talk about how NBA teams navigate the trade deadline that recently passed last Thursday, February 8th. I am Bobby Marks from ESPN, ESPN's MBA uh, front office insider and lead instructor of Sports Business Classroom. And once again, I am uh, joined by um, my co-captain in charge here, Eric Pincus from Bleacher Report, salary cap strategist and writer, instructor at Sports Business Classroom. Eric, how are you, my friend? I'm doing well. Uh, we survived the deadline, which is always uh, a, a workload just to sort of jump through it. Uh, I had a good experience. Always a always a blast. Uh, some were a little disappointed because they felt like there was no uh, like giant, giant thing. But we'll get into that, I think. And uh, other than that, looking forward to All Star. How, how you been? I'm good. Yeah. Survived. Um, you know, it's it's so fun. And we're going to jump into a bunch of things. But it's, it, you know, a trade deadline week. <clears throat> is is crazy just because um it's like you go through like it's, it's a grueling period of time the, the beauty of it is that there's a deadline right like once we get to three o'clock on or three o'clock eastern time on thursday like it's not like free agency where it's kind of it's never it's kind of never ending um but then when you you know i go up to connecticut um for the week got up there on uh sunday and we spent, Woj and I, we were there from like seven in the morning to like, we, we were doing podcasts at night. We did a podcast every night and we would do them at like, like one in the morning, right? We tried to do it as late as possible because in case there was breaking news and it was, you know, listen, it was slow in the beginning, right? Uh, I mean, Sunday, Monday, you know, by Tuesday, I, you know, we I was going into, into the bag of old net stories as far as what to mm. uh, what what to tell and everything like that. And we're gonna we're gonna go into everything as far as what what happened last week, what you know, how the front office has kind of looked at things, uh, how everything navigated, uh, how the new CBA rules maybe played into uh, into fact. I think the goal is we want to take a lot of questions um, at the end. Um, but I first before before I get going here, I do want to talk about the sports business classroom immersive, which is in Las Vegas. It's July fourteenth to the twentieth. Summer league starts on on the on the twelfth. Um, space is limited. Okay, uh, early bird registration opens up to the public on February fifteenth at ten a.m. Pacific. Um, right now, we've got a big waiting list. We have a five hundred plus. Uh, uh, people on our early in- interest list here. So spaces are going to go really quick. Um, we've got only 120 people that are going to be admitted to the program. As you can see there, if you have questions, um, you can call um, Jackson there on um, from Sports Business Classroom. You've got the link there. Make sure you copy that down. Um, this is my first year running um, the, as the lead instructor with Sports Business Classroom. Eric's been a, a staple as far as um, how things have gone in, in the past year, and uh, I am looking forward to it. We're uh, we're in the process of um, hiring our instructors. Um, it's a, an exciting process as far as uh, we've got a lot of people who want to get involved. Um, probably too many people <laughs> that want to get involved. <laughs> So mm-hmm. we're kind of uh, narrowing it down, and, and as we we say, we're gonna we're gonna bring you the best of the best, right? Um, I'm gonna be there probably too long in Las Vegas, just like Eric's gonna be there too long in Las Vegas. Um, but I will be there from the beginning to the end. Same with Eric. Our instructors will be there the whole week, and the, the goal is um, for you, everyone who signs up to learn about breaking into sports, learning about different um, fields, whether it be the salary cap or coaching or analytics, or scouting, media, um, how to write, 
Um, agent negotiations we're adding this year. Um, it's it's a wide range of things um, that go into the immersive. It's a it's a grind. I mean, this is not summer mm-hmm. camp, right? We're not going to summer camp and, and roasting marshmallows that night here. Like we're we're going to put everyone through the ringer here. But um, it's a huge networking event. But um, everybody is. Uh, everyone's going to learn. And I know, Eric, you can certainly share about your your time, you know, working on this. I mean, you've been, you know, one of the main people as far as putting this putting this together here. Well, I, I started in 2016. So I've put, put a few years in and uh, we've had uh, some really wonderful uh, students come through the program. And that to me is honestly... My favorite part, uh, it's not just like a week where you meet people and you never see them again. I, I have people who I talk to literally daily still, uh, former students who work with me, uh, who are, I mean, GMs of G League teams uh, or working with an agency or working all around the country or, or the world, really, because we one of our students is uh, international and he does international scouting for sports business classrooms. So. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful program. Uh, I will answer questions privately uh, if you want to reach out and have questions. Maybe you're considering it uh, because of uh, you know the the numbers. You, you got to get involved, get in, get in quick uh, because it, it'll it'll sell out. Last year we sold out you know well before July. Uh, we had a whole draft show that we did, and we we did a show right after right at the draft, the day of the draft. We're with our students and everything. And we didn't have anything quite to, to sell. We were sold out. So it was just, it was a wonderful show and we didn't have to worry about like, Hey, come on and sign up. We, we, we have no room. So uh, it was just a great exercise and, and we built out a great draft board and uh, I don't even watch college basketball. So, you know, I, 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 lo- I love working with students. It's a great program. We have a great mock trade deadline. Uh, we really help people get jobs, but let, let's dig into it. Um, the trade deadline, Bobby, it was, it was, I felt, I felt it was a fun one. I know that uh, it was polarizing a little bit, but I thought we had a good time. What'd you think? Yeah. You know, it's funny. Like, you know, we, you write about it at length. I write it about at length. You do it, do, do team guides. I do team guides. Um, I do my hypothetical um, trades. I'd like to see, which, you know, drives people, some people crazy. Some people like, sure. I actually, funny story real quick. I got, um, I, 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 I answer most people on social media because I leave my direct messages open on Twitter and Instagram and, and everything. Um, probably not the wisest thing to do, but I like to communicate okay. with people. Because I think I think there's a lot of people out there that want to ask questions. If they're not sure about certain rules and stuff like that. And I I don't mind doing it. Um, you know, certainly there are some people that gets a little bit overboard here, but um after the after the um the deadline on thursday i i was uh, checking something on instagram and i'd got it at an um i actually was during the deadline from a bulls fan who blamed me um for the bulls inactivity during the trade because he said that i di- my trade guide section diluted the bulls front office from going out doing a deal mm. so maybe i take credit for that i don't think that was the reason why our Taurus carnicius did not move uh, Zach Levine, who's injured, or DeMar DeRozan, who's playing well, or Alex Caruso, uh, who's on a terrific contract. Um, maybe, De- maybe Andre Drummond. I don't know. Um, so I do find it. Um, I do find it funny as far as um, some of the thinking, as far as how people think um, our influence is. I think our what we do is we try to um, educate people, uh, whether it be what teams are looking to do. Um, we're not going in this blind. Eric talks to a lot of front offices and teams and scouts and agents. Um, and I do the same thing, right? Like that's just, just how we, you know, we're never, we're always never, we're not, we don't have a hundred percent track record here, right? Like it's, it's, things are, are, are very fluid in everything. And I think certainly when we look at the trade deadline here, um, I always say that in order to do a trade, you got to have a dance partner, right? And as uh, I think Rob Palenka, the Lakers general manager said, like, you know, for him to go out and buy a house, the house had to be for, for sale. <laughs> so when you look at the numbers here, when we go through, you know, there's a lot of people said, well, this t- trade deadline, this, this, there wasn't star power. And there always doesn't have to be star power. When you look at um, Pascal Siakam and OG Ananobi getting traded in uh, late December and then mid January, those were your two marquee guys coming off the board. And then we had a lull, right? We had a Terry Rozier trade. 
um, to Miami. Then we had a um, we had a Stephen Adams trade, which is basically for for the um, for the future. And then as we pull up the graphic, man, we had a we had a wave of trades here, right? We had I think nineteen trades from uh, from February first to the trade deadline. And Eric, you know this very well. You've been doing this for a long time. How front offices operate usually, unless there's something, unless there's an NNOB deal where it's the best trade that Toronto is going to get when you look at what they got with um, R.J. Barrett and Manuel Quickly, or if you're pa- uh, the Pacers front office and the, the Raptors front office is again, like what um, what Toronto got for Pascal Siakam was was going to is as good than waiting until February 8th to do a deal. But Eric, you know this, like front offices react when there's a deadline, when you're forced to do something, when you're forced to take, um, when you're forced to take your best offer here. Well, it, it's, um, I try to, one of the things I like to teach in, in, in Vegas and in the immersive is to try to turn off, um, like what I call fan brain, uh, for, for those who are coming through our program, I don't want them to think as fans anymore. I don't want them to lose the passion of, of being a fan. Like love the game, love what we're doing here, but turn off the, um, you know, your your favorite team or some of the notions that maybe you get from just being a fan. And and I like what you do, Bobby. People seem to like what I do. I think we try to be a little bit more the voice of of, of reality, perhaps, than some other people who are great, but maybe are more hype and uh, yelling and not necessarily uh, talking reality. So our goal is to try to keep it real uh, and a little bit more from the CBA and the in the numbers and, and, and whatnot. But what I like to teach is that you're looking at a menu. And if you're a fan, it's a menu of value. Our players are worth this and we're going to get whatever we value in return. And the reality on the team side is you're getting a menu of crappy choices of things you hate. <laughs> <laughs> and and so like why do pe- people and people with teams have literally asked me like why did t- why does everyone wait so long and I'm like why didn't they just do this earlier it's like you're taking the worst offer or the the best worst offer or you're doing nothing and kicking the can so for instance Tyus Jones was not moved from Washington and I thought he would be because he's expiring but we could say well they set a price and their price was maybe it was a first, maybe it was a young player, maybe it was enough seconds. There was a line they would have crossed, but they chose not to. And you say, well, then he's just going to leave and they get nothing for him. Well, in theory, they might be able to sign and trade him. So there's even that they don't have his con, he's, he's expiring. They have the ability and, and my job and your job as well is to look through what does the summer look like? And I look and I say, you know, Tyus Jones thinks he's a starting point guard and another team might agree and may be willing to pay him starting point guard money. And maybe that's 15, 20 million. I don't know how much it'll be, but it'll be more than what most teams can pay. And Washington's front office probably looked at the offers and said, eh, we could probably get more in sign and trade. And while, like you said, you need a dance partner, maybe there's no sign and trade. If it's just some second round picks that they didn't like, then maybe that chance of doing better later. So uh, turning off fan brain, understanding that the choices aren't, it's not just value. You, If you're the Hawks and you have DeJounte Murray, you have to take the best offer that's there, not the best offer that you write, Bobby, or that I write. Hey, they yeah. should do this and they should do that. And then, you know, at least I like to think we're grounded. And then you have a bunch of pundits who are just yelling stuff of that. Oh, this should happen. This should happen. None of that's based on what's actually offered. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great point. I mean, I think, you know, the Tyus Jones situation, listen, you can make it, you can make the argument uh, Washington is in the lottery. They're not making the playoffs. Jones is on an expiring contract. You have to move him for whatever you can get, right? Um, there was no offers out there for first round picks. If there was an offer for a first round pick, the Wizards front office would have taken it like they did with uh, the Daniel Gaffer trade. We'll, we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, so do you so you weigh the value of multiple second round picks first, um, the option of re-signing him in free agency or using him in a signing trade. And those options weighed more. That was a better option for um, for the Washington front office compared to just moving him. Like just because 
just because a guy's on an expiring contract, and I think you're, you saw this in Chicago with DeMar DeRozan, um, you know, doesn't uh, mean you have to move him if you are in the lottery or you're not a playoff team or you're not a contending team. I think what's happened over the cu- past couple of years, and the front offices agree with you, the playing tournament has changed a little bit of the dynamics here because it gives teams more of a belief Um, whether if you think you're the Miami of last year and you're a playing team and then all of a sudden you catch fire and now you're the eighth seed and you think you can beat, um, you can upset Milwaukee and you can get to the finals. So that's where, that's where you look at Atlanta, for example, right? Atlanta, we've we've heard all about, you know, DeJounte Murray and um, some of their other players here, Onyeko Kangu, who was mentioned a little bit, which was interesting because he had signed a rookie extension, um, as far as them being a seller here, but the, there, there's a challenge when you're doing the de- trade deadline compared to the off season making deals, we're playing basketball here, right? Like there's the emotional part of it. You're looking at the standings. We've won four or five games in a row where, you know, we're now we're only two games below 500. Maybe we have a chance to get to eight. There's all these different factors and you have that emotional factor here. And it, it's the same with, um, with, with Chicago. You know, and our tourist, Carnicious, their their general manager, the head of basketball operations, like basically he kind of came out and said this, like, we're playing good basketball. We like how we're playing. I know, the, um, you know, Levine is out for the, probably, the, probably the year, rest of the year, um, but they have played better basketball here. And we'll see. We'll see if it backfires on them. And we'll see what happens with DeMar DeRozan in free agency. We'll see what happens with Andre Drummond in um, in, in free agency. And then, as you know, Eric, and because you you're there with with the Lakers and certainly with the Clips and stuff like that, um, Rob Plinka made an interesting comment. You know, right now um, the Lakers had one first round pick to move um, at 2029 first, unless they would have went to the Bank of Sam Presti, um, as I call it, and would able to like swap a pick to get a pick, and you know, basically you're like it's like a high interest loan, right? Like you're getting a like a loan of 25 percent interest. Because but you're going to owe something at the end, but the Lakers had one first round pick to move. They didn't see anything worth going out and, and moving a first. And what happens is once we get to the night of the draft, your draft assets start to replenish. So you'll have a 2031 first to move. You'll have maybe a, um, a 2024 first based on what happens with the New Orleans situation here um, to potentially move here. So the, uh, you know Rob said like you know we go from one to three you know, in the off season. And it gives us more of a, um, a chance. Maybe if that all-star type player does become, um, does become available here. And I think that's a big reason why um, I think DeJounte Murray wasn't moved. Uh, I think that's a big reason why I think the Lakers looked at it. Like we have a roster spot. We're below the apron. Remember teams over the first and second apron can't sign players waived with a salary over 12.4 million. Um, and you know, they got Spencer Dinwiddie basically for nothing. You know, they basically got him for a, a, an increased luxury tax bill based on his, you know, his $1.5 million here. Um, but when you look at this, Eric, when you look back at last week and everything like that, the sentiment that I got from front offices is that we we're going to see a lot of, um, players in that like seven to 12 range, like, you know, the, your, your, maybe your your top reserve off your bench to the Xavier Tillmans of the world who were moved um, who were moved in a deal. Um, but before we get there, how about how this new CBA has impact, impacted the trade deadline from your perspective and from what you've talked to teams here? Because there was uh, there was a lot of cash move, right? There was a lot of you know we had forty four players moved. Um, we had a bunch of swaps moved and stuff like that. But how about um, how the new CBA with maybe the expanded um, the expanded um, you know brackets that are allowed the, the expanded traded player exception there. Um, just talking with teams as far as how this maybe impacted the, you know the CBA and everything. Absolutely. Well, if you if you look at the CBA and, and one of the um, one of the things I noticed in the new deal. And it's all theoretical when when it was signed. So the, they agreed to it around April and they ratified it and it started in July. So looking at it, what read to me was the mid-level exception, the non-taxpayer, which is the biggest spending tool you have, after the season can be used as a trade exception. So basically right now, 
or uh, actually, yeah, still now it is a signing exception. You can only sign a player with it. Uh, but if you starting in, I guess, July, you can use it to acquire a player as a trade exception. So when you are a team and you're saying, okay, we need a point guard and you look at the market this past summer, and let's say it's, you know, number one, maybe it was Kyrie Irving, D'Angelo Russell, pretty quick you got down to Gabe Vincent. And I like Gabe Vincent, and he's been hurt all year. But there's a drop, and he's not necessarily all-star caliber. So if you're a team that has that exception, maybe you're not going to spend it anymore. Now you'll look to use it as a trade exception. And then I looked at another aspect. I saw how they increased extensions from 120% to 140%. And as you mentioned, they changed the the bandwidth of trades as long as you're not above these aprons so it's easier to make trades so i was concerned that you know these maybe there's less money in spending tools we've loosened trades we've encouraged I- extensions we may have sort of a shift away from free agency and a push towards trades so that was like my hypothesis going into the year and then when we got to uh the rookie scale deadline before uh, the start of the season, more rookie scale extensions than we'd ever had before. And if you look at the volume of trades, we're seeing trades left and right. It, the last few years, like these numbers, one, 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 three, 19, that's, that's actually uh, a little more aggressive than it's been. It's actually been in recent years, more like one, zero, zero. And then maybe, you know, like at, right at the last week, there's a whole bunch. And then the last day there's, you know, crazy amount of traffic but trades have just like as you mentioned teams are they're they're in it still you have a shot everyone tends to blame circumstance instead of themselves we didn't build a bad team we've just been unlucky unlucky because we got hurt or we lost one or two games we could have won etc cetera, etc cetera. we just make one or two moves and we're better than we are and and etc cetera, etc cetera. and then as you mentioned miami also the lakers got in through the to the conference finals or the finals through the plan. So uh, I think we've seen a lot more when it comes to trade. Um, we've seen more activity. It's easier to do. I think teams are shying away from free agency because I don't think they, it, it becomes more important to get the rights to the player that you want than wait for free agency because you might not get them or you have to cut so much of your team uh, just to get to the kind of cap room that you would need. So I just think we're sort of shifting into a world where trades are easier. We have more and more trades. We have more and more extensions. Um, I wouldn't be shocked if DeMar DeRozan extends before he ever gets to free agency. And I don't know, but to me it seems like there's not going to be a place for him to go unless Philly wants him. That's like the big contender that has money. Um, I, I haven't run through OKC's options. I know they have a certain amount of flexibility, but to me, like how old is everybody on the thunder and how old is DeMar DeRozan? It's like, it doesn't really match. Um, I wouldn't, if I was Philly, I wouldn't go for DeRozan based on age. And I like DeRozan a lot, but I don't think he spreads the floor. So Chicago might be a marriage of circumstance. So if that's the case, just extend him. And so I think that's the kind of thing we're going to see. So uh, I, I think where this went was where I expected it to go. Obviously things happen. The individual moves, I couldn't, I predicted a couple, but you know, I didn't predict all of them, but I think that we're, these are the trends that you have to be more and more clever with trade. Uh, We're seeing uh, like Dallas went out and found another, they found OKC, but they found another, (laughs) another first, like we can say they should do these things. We should say they shouldn't. Uh, Those are subjective. Um, It's more of the, the mechanics and the trends is what we're looking at. And, the trends now are find a way to get something done via trade. And that's why I think Tyus Jones signed and trade unless they keep him. And they may very well just keep him just so that they can trade him after his re-signing restriction, which is December or January, trade him later. So that's the world as I see it as far as uh, the trade deadline, uh, not just the trade deadline, but the the, the NBA is, is going to be more trade heavy. And I think the byproduct of that is that fans love trades. They can't get enough of them. And I think the NBA, I don't think that's why they're doing this, but I think they know that um, fans spend year round debating trades. A game only lasts 48 minutes or so, you know, a few hours for a 48 minute game. 
but the rest of the time they're they're everyone's trying to build their team some some fake trade way so uh, i'm pretty decent at making up fake fake trades bleacher loves it when i do it um we'll help you all if you go to summer league and go to uh sbc and sign up uh we'll teach you how to actually operate your team so that you can make a go through the mock deadline that we have. And I think you get a really great perspective of how hard it really is to get something done. The The, the flexibility is easier, but the human side and the negotiation side and the unreasonable uh, side of the game, which is real, it's unreasonable in, S- in, in SBC. It's unreasonable in real life. So um, I, I cover all the bases there. Am I off on any of that? Or you think that's a good read? No, I mean, I think that's, I think that's a great read. I mean, I think, the one thing that, you know, I, Tim Bontemps and I wrote an article about, and it came out the two a couple of days before the deadline was that how is the CBA and with the, the, um, the more restrictions that we're going to set play and start um, the first day of the off season for teams in the first and second apron, how is that going to impact the deadline? And, and wh- why we wrote about it is that, you know, starting the, first day of the off season, which is April 15th, um, you know, the teams in the second apron, you know, um, you're not allowed to send cash out in a deal. You can't aggregate contracts in a trade. Um, your trade exceptions basically become, I, I call it frozen. Um, it's not available for you to use. All these different restrictions are, um, are, will start limiting you. And, and that goes with teams that are projected to be close to it or in the, in the second apron, like Minnesota, for an example, um, who have high salary in 2024, 25, well, these rules will impact you starting in the off season here. I think where I was interested to see is how many teams were going to take it that we're going to take that use it or lose it approach, what I call it. So what I mean is that you saw Golden State, who has the potential to become a second apron team based on what happens with Clay Thompson and Chris Paul and some of their other decisions. They sent five point eight million dollars in cash to uh, to Indiana with Corey Joseph, and that reduced their luxury tax pe- uh, bill significantly. Here, if this was a year from now, and and um, and uh, and the Warriors were a second apron team, they were not. They would not have been allowed to do a deal like that because you can't send cash. Same with Milwaukee, who sent. Um, Milwaukee said, "I have it up here." Uh, but, 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 but Milwaukee sent $2 million a sack in the Robin Lopez salary dump. They wouldn't have been able to do that. So all these teams that went and, you know, Boston sent $3 million to Portland in the Delano Banton trade, basically reduced their luxury tax bill. Um, those things would not have been allowed. And the same with, when you look at the three-way te- deal with, um, Phoenix, Brooklyn, and, uh, Memphis, uh, Phoenix basically stacked four minimum contracts to go out and get Royce O'Neal in a deal instead of doing a Sear Little and maybe another player. So that trade wouldn't have been allowed next year based on you know how these harsh restrictions are. And I think teams you know took advantage of it. They took advantage of it with the James Harden trade back in um, back in November. They took advantage of with the Damian Lillard trade uh, to to uh, Milwaukee, Drew Holiday trade from Portland to Boston. Um, all these front offices, there is either there's one or two ways you can look at it. Um, you can look at it like you know what we want to get our books in order, and so the second apron and first apron doesn't take a bite out of us, or we're just going to go all in right now and we're going to kind of figure it out, you know, figure it out later, which some of these teams did. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the Clippers actually sent out 2.7 just to get the rights to a player in 2022. Yep. I'll say his name wrong. Ishmael Kamagate. You got it. it. All right. Um, which is like, this is the last day that they could send out cash. And I don't know that they ever bring this player over. Maybe Look, I, I'm not a scout, so I rely on our students, uh, our former students to guide me. Maybe he's an active prospect, but this just may be that if they need to make a trade and don't have a pick and they need to meet the minimum qualification of a trade, this may be just them thinking ahead and they have the money and this is the last day they can use it. And so most teams would not make that trade Uh, 2.7 million for the rights to somebody who may never come. So uh, yeah, so there's definitely that aspect of getting your books in order uh, on a few levels. One, use the opportunities while you can because the rules are changing. 
right? We ha- we're in a transi- transitory period that really has expired for the most part, right? It was really through the deadline. The rules are technically through the end of the regular season, but uh, if it's a trade rule, you can't make any more trades. It's really the the rules are 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 done. You can no the Clippers can no longer send out cash and trade, so they took advantage of that. The other is the financial component where we have uh, today and we have tomorrow. And today, that's the Warriors saying, today we'd like to save some money. And then we have tomorrow, you have the Grizzlies looking at like, this is not sustainable. And so they traded Adams. They traded Tillman, who they weren't going to bring back. Uh, they traded uh, one other player or two. Like they got out of money that hurt their... That, they went from being like the darlings with a low payroll and getting to the second round of the playoffs to like Ja had his issues and then got hurt and everyone else got hurt and the, team, the seat, it's just been a disaster for them. But they're also in this overloaded new setup. Well, under the new rules, they're overloaded with just too much money. There's no way they could opt in to keep Luke Kennard if they didn't make these trades. Uh, or maybe if they don't want Kennard, they can now have the ability to get maybe someone with a mid-level exception that it, it was basically return the same team and pay tax or find a way out. So they did. So there was some getting books in order for now and getting books in order for the future. And then also you know, some teams map out and they say, there's not a lot of money this summer. Like the Sixers might have money. Some of the teams that have money, maybe Detroit or maybe Orlando are in different places uh, or Oklahoma city. For instance, Detroit is really, really bad. Are they going to spend on a bunch of veterans? What kind of veterans are going to – are you going to get um, you know, win-now guys? Like, are you going to get DeMar DeRozan? Are you going to get Paul George to Detroit? Like, it, it doesn't necessarily add up in terms of their life cycle, right? They've got a bunch of young players. Um, now, Houston did do something like that where they went with Fred Van Vliet and Dylan Brooks, and they did go demonstrably older. Maybe Detroit does that. But Orlando – has to think about, well, we got to pay Wagner soon, and we got to pay Sugg soon, and the year after that, we got to pay Paolo. So, yes, we'll bring in money, but how many of these teams are willing to really spend this summer? So, if you're a team that might want to, maybe we'll, maybe we'll be one of those few teams that has cap room. So, there's, you know, Charlotte got out of some money. Teams are always looking for ways to not just plan for today, but plan for tomorrow. Like the teams planning for today should be Denver, right? The teams that think that they can beat Denver should be planning for right now. But Houston made a move that I don't get entirely, uh, but they got Adams and they paid to get him when the Grizzlies were completely up against the wall. I felt like the Grizzlies should be sending out picks to Houston to get out of Adams. But again, I that that was the one that, that got me. Out of all the trades, I was like, ooh, that one I don't understand. I mean, most of them I can argue. That one I'm like, I don't get the, the. I would like to have heard that negotiation because I'm like, Memphis should be dying to get out of money, and Houston's paying them anyway. We'll we'll, we'll get into that uh, a little bit later. So, what else you got? Yeah, I mean, even like you know, I mean, like so you, you put yourself in like the Brooklyn front office, right? And you know, when I was in, in New Jersey and Brooklyn, we looked at everything at least in a three year window as far as how our roster would look, and we would kind of project out. And I think if you're Brooklyn, you go out and you traded Spencer Dinwiddie, who was going to be a free agent, who had actually not played great um, for them. Um, and you go out and you get Dennis Schroeder, um, who has another year left on his contract. And that was the big question for Brooklyn as far as who's your point guard next year. You know, Ben Simmons had been injured. He's unreliable. Um, you know, so now you basically swap out an expiring for a guy that's under contract next year in Schroeder. And you basically kind of bypass the potential of having cap flexibility, which doesn't mean much to teams a- a- anymore. And as you saw, you know, uh, gold, uh, and you talked about it, Oklahoma City and Charlotte did the Gordon Hayward trade, and which was interesting because I think what people there are sometimes deals ha- like just pop up on the on the map, like you know the, the week of or the day of the trade down. You know. But but a lot of the conversations, I would say most of the conversations, have been going on for at least a month. Or maybe going back to, and Eric was there and I was there, back to the G League um, showcase back in Orlando, um, which is kind of like our winter our winter meetings, right, from the NBA perspective, where you start talking about guys. So if you're, um, if you're um, in Oklahoma City and Sam Presti, 
you know, you're saying, you know, hey, um, you're looking at a guy like Gordon Hayward who's on an expiring contract. Um, he had been injured in and out. Um, you know, how does Hayward impact our locker room? That, and that was that was my big question for Oklahoma City is how, can you go out and get a guy outside of your own that doesn't negatively impact your locker room because they've built basically through the draft and, you know, they get Shea in the trade. Most of that roster is in, built is built internally. And you want to move in Bertans and uh, Michik and, um, and Trey Mann here, guys who had not been part of your rotation for a guy like Hayward. Um, the interesting thing was that Hayward had a trade bonus in his contract. Um, and how does that impact the negotiations? How does that impact what's being sent back to um, back to Charlotte here? Um, you wipe out the trade bonus. Maybe the, it's a instead of sending Michik, it's another player and maybe it's Poku, right? Like because of, you know, you're adding a $1.8 million thing, uh, $1.8 million bonus uh, into that here. But um, a lot of, as I said, a lot of the conversations are built on relationships. Um, there are certainly, I know this for a fact, teams, some teams like to deal with other teams better. Um, there's more of a comfort level. Um, less information gets out to the public. Um, the, you know, there are teams that, um, you know, you know, you know, we'll, would do a deal that maybe wasn't discussed a week ago, but all of a sudden maybe it pops on their radar, whether it be um, like hypothetical. Let's say Detroit wasn't putting Burks and Bogdanovic in play. And then New York said, you know what? If we want to go out and get those, we're going to have to put Quentin Grimes in there, right? To kind of make sense as far as a for, from a first-round pick. I know from from prior experiences, just from my days with uh, with New Jersey, and Brooklyn, like, you know, we've traded for, and I've, I've told this before, um, we traded for Marcus Thornton in 2014. Marcus was in Sacramento, and uh, I, I had a relationship with, with uh, Pete D'Alessandro, who was their GM, and I still do. And um, we needed a shooting guard. Um, and basically, that conversation started because I had I called Pete, and we were just talking about our families, you know, over dinner. We were talking, hey, what's going on? How are your kids? What's going on with sports? And then in the course of the conversation, I said to them, hey, you know, what are you going to do with Marcus Thornton? No, I don't know. Were you guys thinking about, you know, yeah, this is what I have. Yeah, we have mm-hmm. Reggie Evans and Jason Terry, and we'll give you a second. Okay, let me let me let me sleep on that. Let me go back to my owner tomorrow. Um, and we were able to get a deal done the next day. But Eric, the the big thing now is it's not just about, you know, hey, let me go back to my owner. It's about, okay, how much is it going to cost against the luxury tax? How much salary are you going to, to um take on? Right. And then when I we the more teams you talk to is like, how is the apron going to impact? How is the first apron going to impact? How is the second apron going to impact here? And that was kind of, you know, that was kind of the feedback I got a lot from teams here is that it's just not navigating the trade and how it impacts no, no, no. the team, but the puzzles, right? The different puzzle right. pieces. It, it's good for business uh, for folks like uh, you and, and, and me and that, uh, and for others who are interested in, in studying the salary cap and, and can decent at accounting and whatnot, be able to run numbers. It, and I wrote about this actually at Bleacher where it's it's um, it's a little bit, of course, some of the deals are about right now. But any deal you're making, more than ever, teams have to project to next year. Teams always had to project what did this mean long term. But in the in the past, it just meant, okay, it puts us in the tax. How do we get out of the tax? Okay, here's two or three ways we can get out of the tax. Let's do the deal even though it, it 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 could be a problem, we'll fix that problem later. That's a livable problem. But when you start to get into these apron territories, now it's a little different. You're basically committing at this deadline to the team. If, if you're not careful, you're not just committing to the team you have now for the rest of the year. You may be committing to this team you have next year as well. That would be like Minnesota, not Minnesota, well, I guess Minnesota too, but Memphis, where like they're so up against it for a team that never pays luxury tax to suddenly be first apron, second apron territory, any move that brought in money off the table, like right off the bat. Um, but if you're like, if you're looking at the Lakers and you make a DeJounte Murray trade, then you say, okay, if LeBron stays and they pay LeBron the max, what does that mean? If you're paying DeJounte Murray, who has a trade bonus, it was around, call it 13 million. Let's say it bumps his salary up by $4 million for next year. I mean, those are rough numbers. Now you're paying him that. You're paying uh, AD. You're paying Austin Reeves uh, and whoever's left. 
and Vanderbilt, et cetera. You start doing the math and it's like, well, now you're right at that first apron. Maybe the most you have to add to that group is 5 million, but you traded away your first. And for my intel, it, uh, rightfully so, Atlanta was greedy. Uh, and I don't mean that as an insult. Uh, I mean that as like, yeah, you should be greedy. This is one of your the best players that you have. So if they don't just want D'Angelo to probably Brooklyn instead of, um, uh, what was it, Dennis, uh, it, probably a multi-team trade and they get D'Lo. And then they're they're not just getting like expirings or whatever. They're getting like, they want Jalen Hushafino, Max Christie. They want a, a first. They want a first swap. They want multiple seconds. Basically everything the Lakers have to offer. Not Atlanta might deny that and say that no, we weren't that unreasonable. And that would either be true or false. Um, I don't know. But from the Lakers' perspective, if that was your question, fine. Maybe it's worth it. But if that money puts you as such that that's your team and all you have left is $5 million next year to add to it, plus minimums, then you're committing. And that's okay if it works. But it's also a high risk. And teams... Teams are risk adverse, especially if you're giving up a lot and you have no flexibility and it's going to tie you into taxes, tie you into aprons. And if you even get above these second aprons, now you have frozen draft picks. Uh, I mean, it's so many little details. And it, it and then you mentioned talking to the owner, like the owner of the team. That's still a huge part of it and, and something we teach. It can be harder to get a, a trade done with or approved by the person who owns the team than getting a deal with some other team. Like you can negotiate a deal all you want and it happens all the time where it's like, okay, I'll check with my owner. And then you go to the owner and the owner's like, nah, I ain't doing that. And it's like, all right, didn't happen. So um, in, in fact, some teams look at like, oh, I'll check with the owner as a uh, basically a rejection in a lot of ways. Like, all right, whatever, they're not serious or, oh, they don't have the authority at this point. So it, it's trades are complex. Um, I wish I could say it was easy. Uh, although on the other hand, on the other hand, it, it keeps us employed that it, that it's not so easy. Um, Bobby, before we we continue, I want to throw out a couple of uh, clerical things. Yeah. Uh, number one, uh, there's a chat, and we're probably not going to see the chat. You and I. Um, there's Q and A. So if yes. you do have a question for Bobby and I, please put it in the Q and A. Uh, yeah. We will uh, after we're done, just sort of chatting away. We'll we'll get to that. And then the other item was is that there is a poll that should have popped up at some point. Uh, take a minute and answer that. Not even a minute. It's like three questions. It's very fast. It's really good information for our, our support staff who want to make sure that we do a great job of uh, servicing you. And uh, it's very helpful. It should take you just a second. So please fill in that poll. Q&A. Hit the chat with each other. But if you're chatting with us, we're probably going to miss it there. Um, but yeah, it's, it, I, I thought the deadline was interesting. Uh, I'm curious to see now that when we get into these new rules, uh, and we start to see, cause everything's been theoretical. Now we have some data, like, yeah. are these trends or are these just the way it is? But we also don't, these are trends based off of a transition period, a transitory period. So what, is, what does the next six years look like of the CBA? We have an idea, we have hypotheses, we have some initial information on what it might look like, but I think once we get into it over the next few years, uh, we'll have a better sense because teams in the past had a high payroll that now some of these teams are, they're just moves they would never make it at this point. They're just not going to make moves like that if it's going to raise their payroll too high. And it's not about just they're cheap. It's not about cheap anymore. There were some teams are always, yeah, some teams is about cheap, but if it, it, the NBA got in a way smarter about how they're penalizing teams to keep spending down. And that's through taking away your tools. We're going to limit your tools. If you spend too much money and you say, Oh, the NBA doesn't want teams to spend. Sounds like, Oh, the NBA is cheap. No, there's a certain amount of money that the players get. They get half roughly of what comes in. If the players are getting too much, that doesn't work. The system isn't working. If their players aren't, if the players aren't getting enough it's not working and the nba's initial projection is that the players got too much this last year and they're they're not going to get their full checks 10 percent of a player's check goes into escrow they only get it back if the if the numbers work at the end of the year and if teams spend too much now everybody 
takes a 10% pay cut, that's not good for anybody uh, if you're a player. So it's not just about being cheap. It's about a healthy system and we're coming after you with your tools. And so it's not about, oh, my owner's cheap, my team's cheap, GM's cheap. Maybe they are, (laughs) but that's not necessarily the motivation here. Everybody wants to win within a certain range uh, of, of spending. And so some of these decisions are more practical now than just financial. Well, I mean, and, and the, the other thing too, is that we're, we're in such an unknown, um, like the one thing I asked a lot of teams with these new rules is like, what's the perfect way to build a roster, right? Like what's the perfect way. And, you know, there, there really isn't any until we get more data in, you know, I think you can probably maybe point to like what Indiana is doing with when you have basically kind of like two max players, um, with, uh, Halliburton next year and then likely Siakam. And then you do a, and then you have a bunch of, um, you know, players that are on, um, you know, uh, you know, Miles Turner is your next highest player. And then you have a bunch of guys on rookie scale contracts here. I mean, that might be the way to do it, but you might have Phoenix go out and win it all this year with three players on max contracts. And maybe the out thing teams will be like, well, that's the way to do it, you know, which is hard. It gives you, you're basically your, um, there's not many insurance policies because your roster is built with minimum contracts and stuff like that. So that's going to be the thing that, to keep an eye on as far as how teams build out rosters. You know, everyone talks about two max guys and then everything else is filled with, you know, a, a $20 million guy and a $15 million guy and a bunch of, you know, guys on first round, um, first round um, contracts. Um, before we get to throw your questions into the Q&A. Um, we're not going to answer the chat. So if you're answering que- asking us questions in the chat, we're not going in there to do that. Transfer those questions over to the Q&A. I did want to bring up, um, we have a couple slides here as far as how sh- the, sh- the structures of trades. Um, because I do think it is, in- is interesting as far as how trades are structured here. Okay? So if you are making a trade, and it's a two-team trade. Um, Eric wants to trade me John Smith, okay? And I don't want to trade him back anything. Nothing. Trade doesn't work. So as you see here on the um, on the slide, basically the, the trade structure, okay? As far as what has to be involved, has to be one of these things, whether it be the contract of an, of an NBA player. And we're taking away the rules of the traded player exception and the matching and trade exceptions and all that. This is just the structure of the, of the trade um, contract of an NBA player, either standard contract or a player on a two way um, future draft pick, um, you know, it could be protected 31 to 55. We've seen that before um, the draft rights to a certain, you know, certain players, like international players. We see that we had a, Funny story, we had Christian Dreyer, who uh, we drafted. This was a long time ago in New Jersey. And I tried to put him in a trade, and I didn't realize he would retire like four years before we tried to put him in um, put him in a trade. So if you want to add a um, um, uh, rights to a player you drafted internationally, you could you could do that as long as he's not retired. Um, the rights to swap an encumbered draft pick, um, and then $110,000. So the one, um, the one trade that... We t- I have we have here. Uh, we're going to jump to the permissible trade real quick. Um, so Boston and Portland made a trade. Okay, this was a minor trade. Um, Portland Boston conveyed to Portland the player contract of Delano Banton. He was a minimum player, so basically a minimum player can be traded without another player matching salary. Um, they they included three million dollars. Okay. Um, Portland conveyed to Boston a conditional 2027 second. The less favorable of New Orleans own and Portland's own protected 3155. That's a simple trade. That met the criteria as far as what is involved, um, what is involved in, in a trade here. Um, as Eric will talk about, it gets a little bit more complicated when we get to like a three teamer because the stakes raise a little bit here. So uh yeah, let's go to the is this the multi let's go to the next slide. The idea here. A little backstory. So like last year, going into the deadline, uh, I was looking and I saw like, man, there's all these high volume, high dollar point guards who might get moved like Lowry, Westbrook, Russell, Conley, whatever. And so I was just playing around. I was actually working with some of my students uh, and we were just like 
I came up with like a four team trade and I'm like, oh, that, that's fun. That works. Everyone think everyone's like, oh, yeah, I think they'd all do that. So I went to Bleacher and I'm like, uh, hey, you mind if I write on this? What do you think? And they're like, oh, yeah, OK, whatever. So go ahead. So I wrote an article and it did like gangbusters in terms of views. So now, naturally, uh, my editors are like, hey, you want to do that again? Uh, <laughs> and now it then this year it became like a, a monthly thing where each month they would have me write like a, a, a fake multi-team trade. And so they are definitely tougher. Uh, the restrictions are the idea is that they don't the league doesn't want teams to just get involved to kind of circumvent the rules. So we're going to make you stake a little bit more. So yes, it has to be a standard actual player, or it basically it's it's anything in the previous list, but a few things have to be ratcheted up. Specifically, instead of one hundred and ten thousand, the barrier of entry is now one point one million. It can't have these quote um, fake picks, uh, like a top fifty five protected pick, like um, I use Charlotte as the example. They have no real pathway. I, I I guess we could do the math. If they win every single game the rest of the season, would they still be the, would they be a top five team in the league? And the answer is probably no. So if they traded, uh, uh, they're not, they're going to be like in reality, 31 to, I mean, generously 40, but probably 31 to 32, 35. So if they're trading the pick only if it's 55 or sorry, 56, 57, it's not going to, it's not going to convey. So those are what we call fake picks. And, when you do a multi-team trade, it has to be a pick that will actually convey, period, in some form. It can't not convey. It, it can't be protected, 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 and then convert to uh, cash or something like that, unless it was enough cash. Uh, and so, uh, and then also, did they take out? Did they take out the rights to a, a, a prospect? Like uh, it can be an NBA prospect. It can be a real. Yeah, NBA prospect, and so yeah. the bear that that might be the Kamigate move, where the the Clippers are like, well, we can't do cash anymore, and we're running out of picks, and maybe we have a player that we want to trade, but it's not enough, and we need to maybe the, maybe it's a three team trade, and their players are going to one team, and they need to do a three team so they can get Kamigate and package him in. As you know what, well. Eric? Memphis did this with um. Um, if we pull up the one, the next slide where the permissible trades, um, Memphis did this with the three team or with um, with Brooklyn and Phoenix, where Memphis sent Brooklyn the draft rights, the Vanja Marankovic, the 60th player selected Rinkovic? in 2019 I... draft because because of the we're not going to get into this, but the touching rule, right? Like every yep. team has to kind of touch as far as um, how the trade works. And as, as that works. Right. Like so if you're a team. As Eric's saying, if you don't have cash anymore to do, right? So you better hopefully you have like a stash of these players that are, you know, that you've drafted in the, in the last couple of years here. Yeah, and there there are players who teams have the rights to that have maybe been drafted in like 99 or or something like that in the last 15, 20, 25 years, something crazy. Um, there is a, a barrier where it has to be a player who is reasonably an NBA player or a potential player, a professional athlete playing basketball because there is like one was it there's one player I forget his name who's a professional wrestler now he never made it to the NBA he is an active athlete but he's not playing in the he's not playing basketball if you traded him and tried to meet this minimum barrier they're going to look at that and say no this is not a reasonable this 50 year old retired basketball player is not going to cut it whereas uh is it Marinkovic or whatever uh he he was drafted what like four years ago, five years ago, yeah. has a reasonable chance of still being an athlete in the NBA. Let's say he's in the neighborhood of 25 to 28 or 30 at worst. You know, it, he's still potentially a player. Uh, as far as touching just the general without getting into it, you have to touch two teams in a multi-team, and that matters. So I, I when I teach this, especially, uh, you know, at, in Vegas or to agents, uh, I do a touching table and everybody's just got to touch two teams. So uh, if you look here, uh, Brooklyn has to touch Memphis. Memphis and Brooklyn had to touch. The way they touched was through the rights to that player. So uh, multi-team trades, I, I want to say if you go back ten, maybe 10 years, maybe 15 years, I don't have any data to say the exact numbers, but there was a time where uh, 
you know, I'd be like, oh, it doesn't work two way. You'd have to do three way. So forget it. It's not going to happen. Whereas over time, it's become in a lot of ways because of the complexity of the rules, sometimes the only way to get certain deals through. So I think we've seen a, a growth uh, and that's eye test. I haven't run numbers. Um, but I remember talking to a GM years and years ago about like, hey, you could have done this. If you just added one team, you could have just very little to just make something work that didn't work. He's like, I don't want to get too cute. You know, the once you bring in more people, it gets harder. And then somebody says no. And that's all true. But, um, you know, it, it is, it you know, some like the AD deal with the Lakers, they brought in the Wizards. Um, we look at this deal here and, and maybe it didn't work um, two ways. Maybe it just needed a little bit extra help. Uh, maybe, you know, because there are roster space issues, you can't go above 15 players when you make a trade and teams don't like to just cut guaranteed salary. So, uh, although in, in a lot of cases, we just saw a bunch of guys, Corey Joseph. And, uh, I mean, there's a long list of guys who just Danilo Gallinari guys who've been traded for recently who've been cut. So, um, and you, know, Bobby, you, you mentioned like the one way to build a team. Like, I mean, the reality is there just is no one way. Um, <laughs> Because each team has its own market pressures and market realities. So, like, if you look at the Warriors, the money that they bring in game to game, it, it exceeds everybody by a, a, a long distance. And then next you have Lakers and you have Knicks. And then I think everybody else is at the any different range behind them in terms of just money that they have uh, to bring in. But then you also have some owners, like the Clippers don't bring in that kind of money but they have an owner who's willing to spend whatever. It doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, which is why te- the league is hitting teams where it hurts with the tools. Uh, but like, yeah, like there is some financial reality of like, you can't, it's going to be really hard to have three max players and then to be able to continue to field a team. Like it's yes, it could be a bunch of men players, but if you're in those second aprons, you know, at some point someone's going to age out, someone's going to get hurt. You're going to have, your picks are going to be frozen. You're going to have no ability to aggregate players. So you're going to be able to add in trade players, but not salary. You're going to be able to bring in guys who make less or equal, but not more. So um, each team is going to uh, have their own reality. And that's that's why we do the exercise that we do in, in, in Las Vegas, where we assign players to different teams. I do my best within reason to not give you your favorite team. So you have to think uh, beyond your, your fan brain. Uh, but the idea is to um, really think through from the perspective of where your team is, how do you become great again? Or maybe how do you go the other direction and start to rebuild, which is the longer path to being a, a viable contender, but sometimes it's the reality. So, uh, But that's three team trades. Uh, do we have any more logistics to go through? No, I mean, I'll give you a um, little bit of inside information on this one here. This one almost did not go through um, because the how the, the the how the trades work is that you have to get all the information to the legal office by three o'clock. Okay, you don't have to get the trade call done by three o'clock. Um, you have to call the legal office. You have to be on the phone with, um, let's say, Eric works for the Lakers. I work for the Nets. OK, um, we call the league office and we go we go over the trades. OK, um, the league will say, OK, that works. And then there's a process of getting paperwork to them, whether it be medical. Most of all the medical stuff's on in an internal database that's shared internally. But when you look at the trade with Memphis and um, Brooklyn and Phoenix for players that are in the last year of their contract, um, they have to sign in. There's an, uh, a certification there that basically there's not nothing promised um, outside of, you know, nothing promised outside of the trade. So if Royce O'Neal is in the last year's contract, Royce O'Neal has to sign this um, this uh, this certification before three o'clock. So when you looked at that trade, there were a bunch of players in the last year of their contract, whether it be Kata Bates Diep, who had a player option, which considers the last year. Um, who else? Uh, Matu was in there. So you had to get all that information in there. So three team trades are hard to do on the day of the trade deadline. Like it's really hard to do to get every, all your ducks in a row. Because as I said, like you don't need to have the trade call done by three o'clock. That doesn't happen. Like the trade calls were happening like Friday morning still. Like it's like it was, there was like a backlog. I got like Nork airport, right? Like all the planes were kind of like, you know, del- delayed here. 
Um, but you do have to get all your information into the league office. Um, the league has the blessed that the trade can work. And then they'll say, okay, um, New Jersey and, and the Lakers, your trade calls at seven o'clock tonight. Okay, great. We'll see you there. You know, and then you do the conference call and everything like that. So kind of just a little bit of a background on that deal, because there was a possibility that that might have kind of, if, if the paperwork didn't go through, it would have maybe collapsed there. Like we had... In, in Brooklyn, Kevin Garnett had a no trade clause, and we traded him to Minnesota for Thaddeus Young in 2015. And Garnett had to sign um, an amendment or a, a certification of waiving his no trade, or basically write a letter out trading his no trade. And Garnett faxed this it, um, which doesn't really happen these days. People fuse a fax machine, but he faxed it to us at like 2:54. And we had to get that and get it over to the legal office in like five minutes, talking about like a mad scramble before we get all the information in by three o'clock here. So that's just kind of a little bit of a background on getting all your stuff into into the legal office by three o'clock. Yeah, we, we have a procedure. We have a for our, our trade, our mock trade deadline. We have it, it's uh, using the tools that we have. Uh, everybody has to write it in the same thing. And it, it's not a trade call, but. And we do you, as long as you get it in before the deadline, then we'll let you. You know, we'll we'll go th- same process, and we do try to help. Uh, whereas the league is not going to help you if if you have something that's illegal in the trade, they're not going to be like, oh, we'll help you fudge it after the fact. Whereas we are a little more forgiving, just because we know uh, students are just learning, and so. But we we don't let anything illegal go through. So uh, you know, we'll we'll work with you, but a little bit more friendly than I think the league would be in these. Cases like someone last year tried to give Nicholas Claxton an extension, and we couldn't. That's, <laughs> that's like the, we had an, uh, someone representing the agent uh, agreed to it, and when we got it, we're I'm like, I, I, there's nothing I can do with that. Like that's just not legal. But there was a touching issue with trades, and it's like, all right, um, let's just get a couple of uh, you guys. You guys got to trade each other a second rounder or uh, you know the rights to some player, and we made it work. So. Um, all right. How about we answer some of these questions? All right. Let's uh, let's get to it here. Q and A. So if you again to if you put it in the chat, we're gonna we're not gonna see it. Just reality. Uh, hit the Q and A, and then also if you haven't done the poll, please just take a second to knock that out. And I do have one quick uh, for any agents who or potential agents who took the exam. And we're waiting for results. Um, they were supposed to come out two weeks after, which was like a week or two ago. Uh, I did reach out on the behalf of uh, some of my clients and some of our, our students. And the MBPA unofficially says uh, by the end of the week, they'll have results. So don't don't quote me on that. Don't quote them on that. But that's the expectation. Uh, Bobby, this one's for you. What's the longest trade negotiation you've had to oh. deal with? Meaning how long oh did it take God. to settle on a deal? Uh, I mean, Carmella Anthony in 2010, I think the, it's still going 12, 14 years later, it's still going on that, you know, it's listen, some deals take longer than others. Um, Carmelo started in September of 2010 and, and didn't get resolved until February of 2011. And he got traded to the Knicks. So that was four, three, five months of trade negotiations. I have a whole book of trade proposals that myself and Pete Del Sanjo share. Um, Dwight Howard was five months as far as usually it doesn't take that long as far as, um, with maybe would star, you know, star level players. Probably if you're asking New York and Cleveland last summer with Donovan Mitchell, maybe that took a month or two and then he was eventually traded, um, to Cleveland here. But I think it's just, I really, it, I, it's just really just Eric, just dialogue, right? Like, and a lot of it's based on where your roster is. Um, you know, some trade, you know, some trade negotiations started a month ago as far as teams talking about certain things. It's, you know, sometimes, hey, get back to me. Hey, why don't we talk uh, closer to the deadline? You know, usually that's how it's, you know, don't, I don't want to dismiss it. Let me put it on my board. Um, let me see where my roster goes. Um, you know, rarely, rarely does, I would say rarely does a trade happen like, all of a sudden the day of the deadline and you're like, you know what, I'm going to trade three of my best players for two of their, but you know, like it doesn't, it doesn't really happen. Does it, the Lionel Banton get traded to Portland, maybe spur of the moment? Probably not. I'm sure there's a, a um, you know, uh, Brad Stevens in Boston, maybe called Portland and said, Hey, if we, if we want to, if we send you 3 million for a cash for a player, would you do the deal? 
you know, you kind of just put that, you know, put that kind of tidbit in there. So I would say the days of negotiating four months or five months is not going to happen. <laughs> I hope not for the sake of everyone. Um, but that was that those two negotiations were long. All right. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll take this one. Anonymous asks, uh, what are trade negotiations like with a player's agent? And are they the agent involved in a lot of the talks or is it just teams? Uh, I'll take that one to say that it's obviously varied. Um, the player's cachet, like they're, you know, LeBron versus Banton might have, Banton's agent may or may not have had any role in that. Whereas if you want to trade LeBron, you're definitely talking to Rich Paul. Uh, it's going to be, be based um, maybe where their contract situation is. Uh, for one, if the player has to approve of the trade uh, via one-year bird rule or something like that, uh, then it has to go through the agent. Um, there are times where I've talked to agents who um, feel like they know, but they never really know because it's not a the, the NBA front office game is a game of poker uh, where uh, truth is not required. It's just there's a certain level of uh, ratcheting up your hand. I don't want to, maybe it's bluffing, maybe it's overselling, maybe it's underselling. Uh, well, there was some reports of Patrick Beverly being told by Daryl Morey that he wouldn't be traded and then he was traded. Like There's some elements of the game that <clears throat> that's part of it. So <clears throat> there are agents who are involved. There are some cases where a player isn't happy and the team will say, you know, if you, you want to go find uh, an opportunity, go ahead um, and it, maybe a trade can develop. Maybe it can't. Uh, they're not going to do a trade just because of it. Uh, an agent wants it. Um, but then we saw James Harden's agent and their people really made that happen. So I would just say the spectrum of it is, you know, I've got one agent friend who's like, I have no clue what's going on. I just, you know, I tell my player just, you know, be prepared. Anything that could happen might happen. And you just sort of roll with the punches. So, uh, but if you're, CAA and you're got a great relationship with the Knicks, then you kind of know like, Hey, you know, you probably know ahead of time. So, uh, yeah, it's varied. Uh, we have another one, Bobby, you want me to grab one? Let's see here. Uh, anonymous attendee, what resources beyond the new CBA do you believe are great tools for us to use outside the classroom when it comes to learning roster construction, strategy, salary cap, negotiation, tactics, histories, I mean, for for me, you know, I'm and I know Eric's probably has his eye a little bit towards the offseason as far as starting to get, you know, prepared as far as whether he's writing, you know, team guys and stuff like that. My offseason articles will not come out probably till April until we get the when the uh, playing tournament starts for the lottery teams. But I'm in the process of, of starting kind of the outlines for for all for all 30 teams. So for that, I would say just keep an eye on. Um, kind of, you know, probably sometime in April as far as when off-season guides will start coming out for teams as far as what to look for and how the front offices are going to kind of build um, kind of build their rosters and everything. I, I actually, you know, in my preparation, I map out the off-season well before the deadline so that I can see where teams might go. Because uh, it kind of, like, that's how I, I wrote an article on the Grizzlies and the Lakers and Marcus Smart. And then the day that the article went live, Marcus Smart got hurt, so it, it was like nine minutes of great story, and then it was like uh, after that, it was like eh, whatever. Still did well with traffic, but um, but now I'm I'm actually rebuilding everything off of the tram about uh, I don't know twelve thirteen teams done of uh, building it together, running through the trades and mapping out the projections. Uh, but we have so many things like options and non guarantees, uh, and this kind of flows right into the next question I want to answer. Uh, which is from one of our students, uh, Gabriel Mendez, who actually is scouts for us and is really, really good. Uh, he asks us, teams in the first and second apron came up with creative ways to duck the tax bill. This deadline, as you guys discussed, with the Clippers, Kamigata deal, or the Warriors, Joseph deal. Uh, with the new CBA kicking in next year, what new methods could you see teams using to lower their tax bill? So uh, the Clippers didn't lower their tax bill, but they did use the rules when they had it to spend money. But um, I mentioned earlier that there's now the the mid-level exception is now a trade exception. Uh, basically, number one, you're going to look for teams that have cap room to dump on. 
Uh, you're going to look for teams that have trade exceptions, actual trade exceptions. But then these spending exceptions now become functionally trade exceptions as well. So you're going to look for that. Uh, you're going to look for uh, players who have partial guarantees. That's always a common way. So um, like I'd have to think about there are some complications like Bertans has an ETO, but the problem is is there's issues with matching. Um, if he opts in, it's only $5 million guaranteed. But there are ways where sometimes that can work. Uh, if the other team, it could produce some matching issues. I guess who is Bertans now? He went to the, was it with the Pistons or the Spurs? I don't even know where Bertans ended up. Let me look it up. Where did Bertans end up? Oh, he ended he's up in on Charlotte. 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 Yeah. Right. So Charlotte has cap room and they have like there there could be combinations of ways to maybe they take on a player and do an unbalanced trade and a team gets Bertans and then cuts him at five million and it also does it during the offseason where they can stretch him. That's another thing. Uh teams in the tax are more like or above these aprons are more likely to stretch. Um so you know there there are ways there are probably ways not necessarily that we haven't thought of, but just things that become more common. Multi-team trades, um, you know, just finding ways. It, it might even be just for teams that it, it sounds like, you know, let me think about it, like maybe finding ways into more players so that you can then get a big enough number to then get out of players. So like you mentioned Nasir Little, like they could have traded the Suns Nasir Little, but they did a bunch of smaller moves so that they didn't, they kept the biggest salary that they had. That's not, um, it's not a big salary, but for them, if they're keeping Grace and Allen and their top three, then really who else they got? Now, Sierra Little may be the only pathway to a good player. And so, again, they can't take in more than what Nasir makes, which is in the six, seven million dollar range. But um, I hope I answered that, uh, Gabe. If not, just reach out to me and I'll, uh, I'll hit you with some, with some more privately. All right, uh, Mason. When teams receive cash in a trade, what benefits does that bring? Is that a real asset? Does it help at all financially for teams that are not over the tax? Well, I think it's a couple ways you can look at it. it cash can offset if you're taking on additional salary um, in a deal. So if you're trading a, a um, twenty million dollar player and you're taking back a twenty three million dollar player, it could um, it could help that. It could help that if you're helping alleviate the team's um, luxury tax pen- bill and your distribution is going down. It could help you pave your parking lot if you want. <laughs> I mean, you could do whatever you want with cash. There's nothing, uh, there's no There's no rule as far as when a team sends you cash. Uh, usually on the, in the trade memo, and Eric has seen that a bunch, they'll tell you how, you know, the team A owes the team B $3 million that will payable in two installments, right? On whatever, in 60 days or whatever. And, um, you wire them the money and it's free reign, right? Like you can do whatever you want with cash. I mean, if 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 you're anybody and you have a chance to have two million more than you had before, uh, I I mean, I think even Steve Ballmer would say yes to that, right? Like, uh, although obviously he was the one paying. Is it a real asset? Yes. Is it a real asset in terms of flexibility? Do, do you get like, oh, we got two million, we could spend two million more on a player? In in the tools department, no. Really, building a team is about tools. Either you have cap room, which is like a super tool, and or or you don't have cap room and you're above, and you have these many, many different tools depending on your spending level. Higher you spend, the fewer the tools, to the point where it just gets to be you just have the minimum. Cash doesn't give you an increase in tools. It doesn't give you the chance to, oh, now we get to sign the guy that we, now the Suns don't because of cash get to sign some other player, trade for some other player uh, or some other team. But the idea is, is that it does, it is a real asset. It's just the reality because um, if you own a team and you have a chance, a front office says, Hey, we can make two, 3 million bucks. doesn't hurt us. We're trading away someone or we're taking on something that we don't want. Yeah. Uh, they'll do that. So, um, Let's go to Liam Willerup, who's asking, what's the most overlooked part of trades that fans aren't aware of, whether that be business or personally related? What do you think about that, Bobby? Um, I mean, I think the ones that is, is the ones that don't happen. You know, I mean, there are a lot of discussions that happen with teams that just, you know, um, 
whether it be just because you couldn't get a deal done or you're like, you know, let's talk about it. Let's talk about this in the off season here. Um, I think that it, 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 for a trade to happen, it takes two teams or three teams to be basically on, you know, some somewhat of the same, I guess, wavelength as far as to agree, you know, to, to do a deal here. Um, I think what's probably not talked about as much is the process of how many people are involved. So why I say that is that um, it's not just front offices communicating. There is a there's a chain of command, whether it be your you have your CFO involved, or if there's if it's impacting your books, or if there's cash involved, or if you're taking out more money in a luxury tax, um, you know, and then certainly your ownership involved, your coach involved. I know there was a well, there was a question on there, and I'll answer that now. Yeah, your coach is involved. Your coach has to to play that player. Or um, you're not going to trade for him. You're not going to trade. Um, you know, we had a, I'm using a lot of examples from Brooklyn, my Brooklyn days is that, you know, we had an opportunity to get Jordan Hill in 2014 and it would have added $30 million to our luxury tax penalty and for three months. And we basically had to make a financial decision and also a roster decision because, you know, was Jason Kidd, who was the head coach, was he going to play Jordan Hill? You can't go out. The one thing you can't go out and do is trade for a player that's awfully expensive, and then him being on your bench, like that, that ain't happening. Because then you have an owner to explain that to. So I would say coaches are involved heavily. Um, there's the analytics um, are involved. Part of it, you know, as far as rotation wise, I think if you're um, if you're Dallas and you go out and get Daniel Gafford and PJ Washington, um, you know, Jason Kidd is involved in that. You know, how does it impact Derek Lively the second, who's playing a lot at an all rookie level? Where does some of you know he's been hurt, but does his minutes go to Gafford now? Um, what happens with Maxi Kleber or Derek Jones? So there's a there's a you're not just going out and trading for a player and then telling the coach, well, you figure it out. Like, no, like he's part of, you know, and it, and that's that's where it becomes a challenge because the coach, it's not the off season. It's they're in season. The coach is getting ready for Milwaukee. The coach is getting ready for Philadelphia. Like there's games being played and everything like that. And um, that's the, you know, that's the challenging kind of part of that. Yeah. It, it, it's a, it is a lot of people involved with trades in a front office. There's the agents too. There's the players needs. I would say that, and this is, you know, slightly sourced, um, but apparently Thibodeau in New York wasn't pro Cam Reddish, but the front office felt that trading for him at the price that they spent mm -hmm. was going to be a like they would profit off of that. If they sent some seconds, they'd be able to trade him for a first. But the Thibodeau wasn't a fan, didn't play him, they didn't build up the asset, right? And again, I like to treat people like players and try not to use the word assets when we're talking about human beings and whatnot. But this yeah. was, you know, in this context of we're going to trade some low assets to get a player and build him up and sell him his his contract, basically, as, a, you know, a, a, we're going to up uh, uh, and we're going to make him something special to profit off of. It wasn't about the player, but you have to be in line. And so I think I could argue like, hey, maybe the, the maybe the Knicks would have went after D'Angelo Russell because of the CAA connection. They want to make sure he gets paid. Well, if. D'Angelo Russell is not a Tom Thibodeau type player. And if they're on the same page, then they shouldn't go get him because it doesn't sink. Uh, and I think the organizations that are in better sync with their coaching staff, their front office ownership tend to do better work. Uh, and the ones who don't sometimes can be very, very obvious. Um, I'm going to pull up uh, Duita, Duita Roseboro. Probably got that wrong. I, I've seen you before in our chats. Uh, was Miami's trade for Rozier more about getting rid of Lowry and under the second apron? I think if Miami stands a chance of upgrading their roster next season, they would have to be able to aggregate salaries to get a better player. Um, so, well, Lowry was expense, uh, uh, rather uh, expiring. Uh, and they are a very high payroll team, but they did add payroll for next year because um, Rozier has a decent sized payroll. 25 million, but it did chop down their number this year. I'm not looking at the exact number of what they saved, but it did save them a considerable amount of like money. Six, like six million, maybe somewhere around there. And and then, they, it, but it was that tax inclusive or is that just payroll? Uh, not including the tax, right? Salary, so, salary. Yeah. And then yeah, the tax, but then you, yeah. The tax is uh, at least 
two, three times that. So, um, and then with Rozier, they they got a a good young, not young, but not old, old, uh, not Lowry old. Uh, no, no uh, offense to Kyle Lowry, uh, but you know, in terms of basketball age, he's a little bit younger than Lowry. Uh, and I I was personally surprised that they gave up um, the draft compensation they did because similar to the Lakers. We talked about how they could give up their last bit and then be locked in, or they could wait. And Miami didn't wait, and they felt, you know, but again, Miami seems to be the team that no matter what, like if they get there, I'm not I'm not picking against them. Like if you give me all the teams in the East, how many teams can we say are proven that have done it that I can trust can get to the finals? Like Boston can get to the finals, Milwaukee can get to the finals, Miami can get to the finals. Who else has been there in the last five, six years, right? Like, is that am I missing someone? Like, that's pretty much it, right? Like, yeah, maybe I'm missing a team. I don't know that the Sixers can do it. I don't know that New York can do it. Maybe they can. Maybe they can. But if you're Miami, I think it's a combination of thinking they got the a, a player that they valued, they saved money in the short term, and you know they can always trade Low, uh, Rozier later. His contract is not great, but it's not bad. So um, I wasn't a hundred percent on board with it, but, um, I get it. Um, let's see. Here's one for you, Bobby. I think makes sense for you to answer. Yeah. How do teams, teams grade their own trade deadline moves? Do teams do a self review of sorts? Who signs off on a trade in the front office? Well, we use Kevin Pelton's grading measure. <laughs> um, how do we grade our, we don't, you know, it might change a little bit now, like as far as maybe there's somebody doing kind of like a comprehensive, it really, you don't grade it until you find out what the proof is on the court. Like, you know, grades are interesting. Um, I'm not a big fan of doing no. it. Like, listen, everyone, we did the Garnett Pierce deal in 2013. We got A's, turned into an F, right? So I think you have to be careful as far as the surface, um, as far as how grades are. I think... Like, you know, like with Kevin, um, and I understood, you know, with Kevin Pelton, who's terrific at, his, at what he at what he does, you know, he gave Dallas D for the trades of um, Gafford and maybe it was the Washington, it was one of the trades he gave, I think the, the Gafford one, he gave him like a B and PJ Washington was like a D and stuff like that. So I understand it from like that point of view, but I think from the front office, the front office's viewpoint is a little bit different than maybe you know, what's kind of written as far as grades where you're looking at it kind of like win now. Like if you're Dallas, you're looking at it like we have Luca, we have to win now. I don't care that we did a swap right with San Antonio when we traded for Grant Williams and now we're trading him again and sending a top two protected first to Charlotte to get PJ Washington. Like, yeah, when you take it all in, that's not good. <laughs> right? Like that's mm-hmm. not how it's supposed to be to be done and everything like that. But you're looking at it from like you're you got Luca and you got Kyrie and you got to win that and stuff. Yeah, uh, and you you'll you'll worry about that stuff later. Yeah, I mean, uh like uh so on one hand, like I work for Bleacher Report and they want me to grade stuff sometimes, and so I do. Uh and when we do our mock trade deadline, we need to judge what the students have done. And yep. so we will it's not a letter grade. But it's like we have to rank what we think of it. And some of these things, you know, you, you think the Gasol brothers were traded for each other and people lost their minds. And it did lead people to... Wanted, people wanted the, the, the commissioner to veto the deal. But it, it, it was the best move at the time that the Grizzlies had ever made. Yeah. It, it, it led to their best run. Uh, and that, look, the jaw run now may be great. It may not be great. We don't know yet. But historically, the Gasol, Conley, whatever... That was the best that the the, the Grizzlies had ever been, and it's because of that trade. Um, I mean, we, I, uh, one example of grading the individual parts. If you looked at what the Suns did the year that they got Ricky Rubio, one of the trades was like they paid the Pacers to take T.J. Warren, who became like the star of the bubble, even though he didn't make the the um, play in or the play. I guess they didn't. He didn't actually make it, but T.J. Warren was like absolutely incredible. But T.J. Warren ended up getting hurt and never was that same player. And if you looked at all the moves that the Suns made over the course of that year, it made sense of like, okay, how can we build around Devin Booker and DeAndre and then the pieces that they had? And they 
saw, okay, what if we got like a pass first point guard to drive this thing? And it worked. Now it didn't work great. Like the Pacers were great in the in the in in the bubble, but they didn't make it. And then they upgraded Ricky Rubio to Chris Paul, but they had gotten the proof of concept of like a uh, this is how our team can work. And if you looked at all the moves they made that enabled them to go from what they were, which was crappy, to a, a very good playoff team, you know, the didn't quite win at all, but got to the finals. You see that from those that summer. I would give them an A for the summer. But if you look at the one individual move of TJ Warren that you're paying to get rid of at the time, I mean, that would have been like, that's a crazy, it's a bad move. So sometimes the individual parts have to be part of a greater whole. And I would argue that even uh, that that's more the case now with our new rules, with our restrictive rules, that it can't just be what is on the surface right now. It has to be with an, more of an eye on next year than ever. Unless you're absolutely win now period at the absolute top of the list and everything you're doing is only about winning right now, you have to think about more than that. So um, how about, uh, this is also from Anonymous, how long does it take for a front office to generate best case and worst case scenarios for a particular player or a package. I, I don't know if they mean before. I, I assume that means leading up to the trade deadline. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think. Wait, wait, I'm best case, worst case scenario for t- as far as what the ups, I mean, I don't really understand. Like, like if you, I guess if you're weighing packages and you have two, three choices, how do yeah. you weigh like upsides or what's the best case and the worst case? Well, I mean, usually what you're doing, you're putting them on your board and you're basically ranking them here as far as short term, long term, how it impacts you financially. Um, is this the best we're going to do? Right. So if you're, as, as I said, like if you're looking to trade OG and OB and you get a deal on December 31st, you're saying to yourself, can we wait until February 8th to trade him? Are we going to get something better? And the answer for that was no. So you, so you do the deal right there. Or if you say, um, I'm looking to trade. I'm I keep on using Delano Banton. I'm looking to trade with Delano Banton and get rid of his money. Can I wait until February 8th to do it? And the answer is yes, because there all there will always be a team that's willing to take on a player in cash. I mean, that's just that's this the reality of it. Right. I I I don't know that it again, it's 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 not necessarily a menu of choices of things you like. It's more of just like these are this is what we're discussing. Like how many offers did Atlanta get that were real viable, tangible offers to, for DeJounte Murray? The answer is probably between zero and two. Same like thing with Zach Levine. Same well, but that was Zach closer Levine. to zero, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably yeah. About zero. <laughs> um, the, like, the yeah, was. I mean, like, and it's like it's the same thing with maybe Andrew Wiggins in Golden State, and you're weighing like, okay. Is it worth keeping Wiggins or is it worth dumping him for expiring contracts? Is it worth restoring the value of Zach Levine or trading him just, this is hypothetical, or trading him for Gordon Hayward and another $4 million player? And that that wasn't offered by Charlotte, I'm saying. I'm just throwing that out there. Um, is it worth, what does cap flexibility mean to us? Or can we hopefully get Zach Levine healthy and he can play like an all-star again and maybe down the road instead of him having um, – Three years and $138 million left on his contract. Now it's two years and $100 million and stuff like that and becomes a little bit more um, appealing here. So I think that's how teams look at it there where like unless you really have to trade a player, your best probably bet is holding on to him and hopefully restoring his value at some point where maybe you can flip him down the road. Right. That'll bring us right to James uh, DiBiase. I think I got that close. Uh, who, who asks, I understand that Atlanta may have been greedy. That's in quotes, which I think is quoting me. Uh, but what uh, what are your thoughts on teams punting to the summer, similar to Washington, waiting for a signed trade on Tyus? Do you think the Hawks front office made more options to trade Murray in the summer or less? So uh, I'm not 100% sure they want to trade DeJounte, right? Like they were shopping him, and then he started hitting like game winners. Like Trey Young is an all-star but he's a very polarizing player and some teams wouldn't touch him for free. And some teams think he's amazing. Uh, He has a mixed reputation on what he is as a player. Uh, I don't know that they 
trade DeJounte or do they trade Trey down the road? I I had heard that the decision was they're going to build around Trey going into the season. But, you know, it's it's still a relatively new front office. You know, they've had shifts and, you know, people coming into power and maybe they've had a little bit more time. And then also Quinn Snyder came in midway last season. Maybe he believed one thing going into the offseason and now maybe midway through the year, he believes a different thing. And again, that's not me saying one way or the other. Other than to say Atlanta didn't have to trade DeJounte. The, there's always risk, right? There's risk that he could get hurt and and maybe the best that they had offered now they don't get and he has a bad injury and he's never the same. Not, you know, I would never wish that on anyone. But let, so if you say worst case scenarios, the worst case is that. But let's not go to worst case. Let's go to like, you know, reasonable, yeah, if players get hurt, maybe he's out a month or two. But if he's pr- reasonably healthy and productive, he's going to have value. The other aspect is, is that he has a large trade bonus. Uh, 15% of his remaining salary. If they wait, they're not paying 15 million, 15% on the remainder of this year's salary. So it's less money. The team that trades has to pay the bonus. We saw, um, you know, in some of the deals you might have seen, what was it, the Charlotte one, where yeah. they there was some cash that was sent. It's not direct. They're not paying for the trade bonus. They're paying cash in trade. How that team allocates that, the receiving team allocates it, is up to them. You're you're not allowed to technically pay for a player's bonus. Um, Lakers could offer six or so million dollars to not quite seven, but I think it was like six something to uh, the Hawks that maybe would offset some of it. Um, but it didn't get there. So I, I just think that it's very um, the media and of which we are, uh, but. Uh, certain media personalities tend to be absolutist. Uh, fans tend to be absolute, absolute. Like this is a disaster. You're terrible. You're horrible. Or this is the best thing ever. Usually, it's neither. It's like you, you know, it's things aren't that bad. Things aren't that good. Uh, it's not pessimistic. It's not optimistic. It's more pragmatic. Like you know, the team's making the best decision they can. Sometimes it's a, a grand slam leads to a championship. Something as simple as like KCP, Contavious Caldwell Pope, to the the Nuggets maybe the reason why they won or um you know Aaron Gordon before that like these individual doubles right or singles you know I don't know what Aaron Gordon probably a double KCP maybe looked like a single ends up being a double or if in 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 collection those are all home runs because that led to them winning a title and you know our job is to like ah no you know make it you know and people will yell and you know, people send me clips. I try not to watch any of those pundits uh, or anything like that. I mean, I try not to, but people send it to me. You know, I, I did watch um, like Bill Simmons. Someone sent me Bill Simmons talking about like why Cuban's doing this because he's not going to be running the team because they're going to fire him anyway. So he might as well trade. I'm like, I don't, does Bill Simmons, do you know his the agreement? I didn't see the sales agreement. Like I still see Shelly Sterling at the Clippers. Like they, part of that ownership deal was that she's got courtside seats. So I don't know if that transfers to the Inglewood gym, but like, I don't know what Mark Cuban's deal is. He may have it in writing that he's like in charge of basketball operations for 10 years. I don't know. So I try not to overstep and and assume things. Uh, And maybe that makes me good or bad at what I do. I don't know. I think it makes me a little better, at least in my wheelhouse. But if you want me to be a big yeller of like, hey, this is happening you know, you're an idiot. Every you know, that's not my style, and and everyone has their, their their areas. You know, I, I don't think Bobby and I are are more of the yeller types. I try to stay away from that. I I did it once, and it didn't work out well. So, <laughs> not a yeller. Hot take. You know, not a yeah. Fun. Hot takes. I mean, I it's important to have an opinion. I don't want to say yeah. we don't give opinions. I'm just saying I try to give a more measured one, a more thoughtful one. And try to look at both sides. And like again, like I don't love Miami getting Rozier as they're using their one main chip. But you know, I also didn't know that like I didn't think they'd be in the finals last year either. So I'm willing to like not go by my ego as like, oh, I know better than they do. Right. So some things are obvious and some things less so. So um all right, I guess we still have a yeah. Let's grab a, a couple, amount. couple more. Um, then everyone can go back to watching uh, 
11 games uh, tonight. There's a lot of I games got one here. Levy Peters asks, why did they waive Spencer Dinwiddie, the Raptors? Well, you want to go I, into I that? I mean, it, listen, you, Dinwiddie had to be waived by the 1st of March, come playoff eligible. Um, Toronto was going, they're a lottery team here. Um, you had incentives they saved, too. They saved themselves $1.5 because <laughs> Dinwiddie had a, he had a games played bonus in his contract of 50 and he was at 48. Um, that's a big reason why he signed with the Lakers for their rest of their mid-level, uh, non-tax mid-level exception. Um, so, I mean, if you can say, why did Schroeder, why did they trade Schroeder for Dinwiddie? And re- basically it was kind of a clean wash. I mean, you got rid of Schroeder's contract. Um, Brooklyn, it was a no brainer here. So I think if you're, if you're, um, when you signed Dennis in uh, July, it was under different, ex- the different set of circumstances, right? He was probably your point guard. You get Emmanuel quickly in a deal now. Quickly is your point guard it's, you know, this year and next year. And, um, you know, you move on, move Schroeder to a, a, a different place that has a different, he has a more increased role, let's say. And Toronto has more flexibility now yep. with their moves as far as Dennis coming off their books and whatnot. Um, I'm going to shotgun a few that are very, very fast. Um, Mon Anthony Valmoria asks, can the Spurs trade for Trey Young? Um, you know, like if, if they offer enough, they certainly have the means. Um, what, uh, Rian maybe? Uh, I'm not going to do the last name. I apologize. How much weight should we put on trade speculation when we see the same team's name involved everywhere? For example, like I look at who is sourcing it Um like I don't think that like someone like Woj is less rumory and more mm-hmm. like you know this is what's going on. He's a little bit more transactional, but he does talk about what's going on, and people talk to him. And I tend to think like, uh, well, on some uh, they may be using him on some level to s- s- put out their message of, uh, to the public, uh, but he's not just making stuff up. You know what I mean? Like that. So. But there are some people who are like, oh, this is a guy on Twitter who or X or whatever it is who's got like he created his account yesterday and he's saying this is going to happen. Or this person who claims to be the son of the this, like, uh, you know, so like uh, vet your sourcing. Uh, don't just assume just because you see it that it's real. That yeah, I mean, I, I would just say we live in a little bit of a dangerous world of aggregation, right? Of People taking like I, I remember going on um, um, doing NBA radio with uh, Frank Isola and talking about like. Um, Zach Levine and I said, yeah, I said I I could see a team like Detroit becoming interested, and this was before Levine got injured, and um, because he would be their big free agent, right? You can throw out expirings and stuff like that, and that would make sense, right? And then it got aggregated that Detroit was in on trading for Zach Levine. Like it doesn't work that way. So I think you do have to be. There's a lot of it's a, the world is different than it was ten years ago as far as. Um, how we look at things. There's a lot of people who like to aggregate and take something and spin it into different, different, multiple different ways. Yeah. I get aggregated all the time. And it's, it's, it used to be like in the early days, it's like, oh, cool. So my article got picked up. It means I'll get a lot of clicks. Now it's like, well, a portion of what I said, totally out of context, without a link to my story, doesn't get me any clicks, doesn't portray what I said at all. It's just cherry picking words that don't make any sense. But I've had like the owner of a team call me up once upset with something I wrote. This is like going back like some years in the early days of aggregation. And I'm like, did you did you read what I wrote? He's like, well, no, I saw it on like this side of the other thing. I'm like, just click through. Just click, click, click it. It was like, you know, this is why it was good. You know, and look, if this person gets hurt, then it, it didn't work out. It was a bad move, you know, whatever. And like they're like. The aggregation was, I said it was a bad move. I'm like, I wrote a whole article on how it was a good move. Not that this is a bad move. It was just they took one little part. Um, there's a couple that we're going to skip because we kind of um, touched on already. So if if you see that we said we didn't answer you, it's not that we didn't like you. Um, Nolan, that's kind of, we touched on this a little bit. You asked about analytics and eye test and the Schroeder and Dinwiddie. I feel like we've touched on that a bunch. Um, Abzi Day, uh, this is a more of a SBC question, Sports Business Classroom. I'm from Australia, and I'm keen to join the program. I'm not going to do an Australian accent. That would be very insulting, and I'm not very good at it. I'm practicing, though. Uh, is there any differences that I should know about compared to a domestic student? Uh, the time zones, super crazy. My freshman roommate at UCLA was from Australia, and I don't think he ever adjusted to the uh, time change and overslept a final. I had to wake him up, and he was like an hour late to his final. Uh, 
No, um, we do have usually uh, a decent contingent from Australia. Uh, Deakin University, we tend to have a a, a great uh, group from there. Pete Williams, shout out. Um, so, uh, you know, obviously, I don't know. I'm, I don't know. There's some natural. I, I've never been to Australia. My wife has. There's obviously some things to adjust to. Reach out through that link uh, that we had shared originally. Um, the calendar. What was it? It was. Um, I actually have it. Um, calendy.com slash Jackson dash. Oh, it's too much. We'll put it in the chat. Uh, Jordan, you mind putting that in the chat? Um, I'm trying to rush through and get through the easy ones, but um, let's see here. Here's a good one. Um, how do teams look at certain future draft picks? This is from Liam again. Uh, how do we? How do they avoid bias in believing a draft pick won't be valuable? And what do they do to predict where it could end up X amount of years down the line? It's a good one. I like that question. What's your thoughts? Oh, um, I mean, I think rarely do we see unprotected ones. Right, like we don't live really in, unless they're they're star players being moved, like you know Gobert and Mitchell. That was kind of a unique situation as far as unprotected ones here. I think, um, yeah, I think second round picks probably become more valuable nowadays. You see more second round picks traded. Uh, you know, I don't think teams are looking at um, when you say, "Oh, we have you know we're going to trade a 2029 first. That pick could be like." the 31st pick in a draft. Like you're not thinking that there, right? You're just basically kind of adding that to, um, you know, but if you're looking at it, let's say New York has four first round picks to, to trade this year. Okay. Which one is the least valuable that we can add in a deal? Is the Detroit one? Is it the Wizards first and stuff like that here? So you kind of have a, you have a pecking order as far as what your draft assets are, as far as how you go about doing it. I think you're, you're a different, a different boat, um, when you're looking at it, um, you know, with, with second round picks, like I gave you an example, like Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City's sitting on a monopoly of draft picks, right? They've got over 21 seconds and they've got a ton of first tier. And they went out and basically, I, I've been teasing this, like I call it the Bank of Presti, where teams that don't have draft picks are going to them and swapping first round picks for a live first round pick, right? So, Dallas did not only have one first to trade, they went out and swapped the 2028 um, uh, first. Uh, they, yeah, they swapped the 2028 first with Oklahoma City unprotected. And the trade-off was that the, the, the Thunder traded them the second least favorable, right? Not the most, it's not the first least favorable, the second least favorable of basically uh, Utah, um, Oklahoma City, Clips, Houston, some of them has protection, some of those. So they're looking at that 2024 as not a value year as far as from their draft equity standpoint. They they have more value. They feel like there's more value in 2028 of a swap than a live first round pick in 2024 because who the hell knows where the Mavericks are going to be in 2028. And that team might implode and Luca might ask me, I'm just throwing hypotheticals. Luca could be asked to be traded and Kyrie won't be there. And you might have nobody on the roster. And that could be the swapping the first pick for the third, you know, whatever, whatever it is here. So that's how teams look at it from a, from a value standpoint there. Yeah, I, I do teach this. Um, <laughs> you know, we haven't uh, uh, built out the curriculum yet for this new year, but in the last couple of years, I've literally taught like an hour of class, uh, at SBC on draft compensation and value. Um, for instance, the Pacers giving up a couple of firsts in this draft, knowing that they are in the range of whatever, 18 to 25, I don't have to look at the exact ones, is different than giving away, like you mentioned, the Dallas first that might be post Luca. And we've dinged teams every year. The real, our, our fake Dallas teams always trade unprotected firsts post Luca and get dinged on it. And then like, you know, the Mavs actually did. <laughs> so, I mean, maybe we're the ones as judges who should be dinged. Um, let's go through a couple more. Um... Let me ask this one here, uh, Eric. This one is from Mason. I think I'm saying that right. 
Uh, wanted to ask about the way around trading players that cannot be aggregated, but doing so. For example, the Wizards trading Gallinari and Muscala together to the Pistons for Bagley, Isaiah Livers, the Knicks having Malachi Flynn in a deal to the Pistons uh, that dealt with Burks and Bogdanovic. How are teams working around that? Mm-hmm. Well, it's all the, it, it's it's when you look at trades, it's not the totality of the trade. Okay, so when it's reported, okay, when woes breaks. The Knicks are trading Alec Burks and Boyan Bogdanovic for, you know, four players. It's not four players for two as far as how the money works here. It's basically broken, being broken up into like multi-trades. Okay. So it could be, um, you know, two separate sets of trades, whether it be um, Archandiacono and Grimes and Fournier for... Um, uh, Bogdanovic, for example, um, it could be I could be Flynn into the um, Marvin Bagley trade exception. Like they're they're all they're they're multi layers to the trade. It's not just one combining thirty million dollars for twenty five million dollars. Like you're allowed to kind of that's how trade exceptions are sometimes created. You're allowed to kind of break things up there. That's how you kind of get away away from like the aggregation there. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll just um, let me let me get to the next one here. I'm just trying to take a scan of what we have here. This one is a little complex. It's from ATZ, um, and I'll just summarize. They're basically asking about aggregation. You you can't combine exceptions. Uh, there's yeah. a question asking basically, can you take like, and I'll, I'll summarize, can you take like two trade exceptions worth ten million? to take in a $10 million player. I think that's the bulk of it. It's a long question. The answer is no. Um, You can't combine exceptions. Uh, When you're trading a player, you want to look at it as like you're trading, look at them as like their salary becomes an exception, right? So if you're combining, you can't combine exceptions. I guess that doesn't work because you can combine players into an aggregation. So you can't aggregate a player with a trade exception or you can't combine two trade exceptions is the short answer. Um, I did want to answer this one. Um, oh, so he's saying it's using two five million players. So clarifying, it's using two five million dollar five million players into two five million exceptions. That's legal. Like if if you mm-hmm. have, yeah, if you have two fives yeah. and you're taking in two fives, no problem. But if it's two fives to get to a ten, now we got a problem. Uh, okay, uh, Kyle Frail asked, why is there a trade deadline? Um, because you can't be swat. Like there's a point where we need a deadline. Can't be trading players up until the last day of the season, all kinds of circumvention issues. Um, generally when I get a question like this, the best answer in this circumstance is to just give you one word answer is because it's just because this is the way it is. This is a better question to ask it in summer when we can have like a long conversation in office hours about this um i do uh want to hit this one amit um is asking about should the lakers have gone in a different direction entirely opted in beasley bomba didn't have an option but they could have guaranteed him and then use that as expiring so in theory you could say that's a possibility sure they would have had more outgoing salary but just because a player is expiring doesn't mean that there's a taker right like who like like Evan Fournier, just just because let's say the Lake the Knicks did not trade him, he has a team option for next year, and you say, you know what, we're going to pick up that option. Well, what happens if you don't trade him? You got a nineteen million dollar player that doesn't play for you, and you're in a luxury tax now. Right. So the, the Lakers would have had more flexibility in terms of spending to a higher limit, but less flexibility in terms of spending exceptions and trade matching. So it becomes a, you know, what do you prefer situation? What do the Lakers prefer? Number one, do they put guaranteed money into Beasley, who was not good? For, he was actively not good for them. Now, if he's good for the Bucks, good for the Bucks. But he was actively not performing to the value of his contract with the Lakers. Mo Bamba came in, immediately got hurt. Whether he could have done more or not is subjective. They decided it wasn't worth that gamble of finding out. Instead, they felt that it was better investing money into Torian Prince 
and Gabe Vincent. So if we want to say that Gabe Vincent was a mistake, you can say that. Um, but that I don't think they I my recommendation at the time, uh, both privately and publicly, was that they opt out uh, Bamba. Now, if the new rules hadn't come in as such, then I might have had a different recommendation for the Lakers. Um, all right. So ATZ is is clarifying. I want to clarify my point in my question. Can a team trade out the ten million player, take in two ten, five million dollar players into their existing two five million TPs, and then get a ten million dollar yes for TP for the player they're trading out? I'm mainly interested in the creating of a larger TP by trading out players. Right. So like the way it works is that the accounting works. It has to be legal for every team. If it's two teams, cool. Three teams, every team has to be legal. How you account for it is up to you. So if you can trade out two fives and then by doing so, I guess you're trade out a $10 million player and take in two fives. So yes, if you have the means to take in the two fives via other exceptions and you're trading out a 10 for nothing, that's exactly what you can do. So I think you are, like, here's you are an, correct. Here, here's an example of what happened in the Brooklyn um Toronto trade. So Brooklyn had a big trade exception that was created last year in the Kevin Durant Phoenix trade. I think it was like 19 and change or something like that. Um, they traded um, Dinwiddie to Toronto and took back um, uh, Schroeder and Thaddeus Young into the Durant trade exception. Okay. And what happened now is that, and that trade exception was going to expire, I think, like February 9th. What happened now is that Brooklyn now has a 20.3, whatever, million dollar trade exception that's created from the Spencer Dinwiddie trade. Okay. So the, the trade, those the, the, that money went into those trade, that Durant trade exception, Dinwiddie went out, and a new trade exception was created, and you have that for a year now. Yep. And they did the same thing, uh, similar with, um, Bates' job was a minimum. Yep. Goodwin was TJ Warren. Um, yep. And so they got for Royce O'Neal a full 9.5. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that should answer your question this time. Uh, it, there's a lot. We're still, we're almost at the end here. Uh, I want to try to get to everybody, but we're running. Uh, okay. He has said that we have, thank you. We have answered that uh, finally. Um, do you think today's NBA, the July moratorium, lasts too long? What do you think? Is it too long? No. <laughs> it, it doesn't last. I mean, listen, I think you'll never be in a situation where free agency starts June 30th at 6 p.m. And then all of a sudden, like, you, there's like a process as far as, um, you know, whether it be setting the salary cap or, um, you know, it's we, it kind of comes in phases. Like, th- just because there's a mor- moratorium, you can still sign first round picks. You could still sign a player to the minimum contract. Two way minimum contract. You could sign a two way player. Like there's still like you just can't trades officially cannot happen. Players officially cannot be signed if you're signing a you know max player for for example here. Um, you could still sign a player to a um, to an offer sheet. The clock doesn't start until you know you know all that. So like I don't. Um, I don't think the more, you know, I don't think the moratorium um, doesn't move me one way or another if it's on July 6th or July 4th or July 3rd as far as how, you know, how things are there. I, I would argue that it's probably longer than it needs to be. Yeah. But it needs to be at least, I think, three days. I think I wouldn't want it to be less than three. Um, give some time for players to clear waivers from June 30th, things like that. Like I'd want there to be uh, that period of time. The history of it is it used to take a few weeks for the NBA to do accounting, but now we have modern technology. They can, they basically know their books and are uh, within a margin by the, um, you know, it's all worked out ahead of time. So the reason for the moratorium as it initially existed is no longer, but they do like the pause. I just think you can argue that it needs to be two or th- I would say three days. It needs to be two. So add a third, give it a little breathing room, but I don't think there's any impetus to change it either. Either 
the only reason you might, I don't even know why you would change it. I just don't think there's enough reason. Like if we were moving the the draft and moving free agency before the draft, like there are some crazy proposals that I don't think have any legs, then, you know, we could start getting into that. I just don't think it's important enough for anybody to fight for. And I think any change like that involves fight. Um, I think we kind of answered this, but uh, this from James, do we anticipate CBA changes to further alter strategies. I guess that's kind of like a, a last thoughts. I mean, we'll go through the last few questions, but w- what do you think CBA might change strategies in the, in the near future? Well, I mean, I mean, I think we're still in a wait and see approach as far as how teams are reacting to the, the apron first and second apron this off season. So we won't know until that happens. Um, listen, the, the, the CBA isn't up for a long time. We're in year one now. But the one thing I know that the league does and teams do and PA do is they keep a notebook, right? Keep a notebook as far as what works, what doesn't work, what doesn't, you know, what um, you want to get addressed. Maybe they, they, we adjust extension rules, right? And we do extension rules based on the percentage of the cap and not at 140%. So I think we're, I think this thing is so new. Um, and I think that's what you hear from teams. Like who's the guinea pig, right? Like who's the guinea pig for the second apron? Is it Phoenix? Is it, is it Milwaukee? Um, how does that going to impact, um, you know, as far as how these teams build out? Uh, I would want to answer this one here uh, pretty quickly. Ra- Rahul uh, is just asking about the Jazz, and I'll just answer quickly. Like, like they chose to trade Olenek and uh, Onchekio, who are who were, according to this question, valued by the franchise um, as far as people. But, you know, they had the chance to get what were essentially late firsts. Uh, and so just the answer in general, the question is, which is wondering how teams weigh these sort of variables and flexibility and things like that and play in position. Like it is really going to be case by case, team by team, owner by owner, GM by GM or whatever their title is. And then it's going to be contextual based on, um, you know, where they, where they're going injuries, what they think next year will be. There's no one right answer. Some teams that should go for it don't. Some teams that don't should or do or don't, or I don't know if I said that right, but you get the point. Sometimes it's it just might be like they look at next year and see like we have a great opportunity. Let's go get make sure we have the best shot at women Yama, then, you know, whatever. So there, it, it's always going to be subjective. That goes the same thing ATZ asks again, same kind of thing as far as like, the Houston versus OKC approach where Houston was kind of doing it the way the OKC, the OKC is doing it. And then they sort of bailed out and went for veterans. Like, again, there's no one right approach. It's all contextual. It's all situational. Um, it's much easier to break down a good team than it is to build one up. It's much easier to trade good players and get picks for the future than it is to convert those picks into great players. That leads to a team that can win a championship. Or at least compete I mean, we'll, at the highest we'll level. Do, um, I'll ask. We'll try to wrap this up here soon. Um, anonymous attendee asks, "How did the Pistons successfully escape the situation they were in, where they had too many players? For example, they waived Daniel House before having him on the roster of fifteen. Do not did not think this was allowed. What's reported when a trade happens and when the trade call happens are two different things. Okay, so." Just because it's reported and it made it look like Detroit had 20 players on their roster, they didn't. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. what happens is is that you you stack your trade calls, right? And most of these trade calls is that the player doesn't have to report and the player doesn't have to pass a physical. So basically, you do your trade call, you basically put a bow on it, and then you can waive that player, and you can keep on doing you can keep on doing that here. So they didn't they didn't get away with anything here. They were, you know, basically uh Daniel House was their 15th player. They waived him. Now they got an open roster spot. Now they can go out and do a, a different deal here. So you ba- it's just a matter of kind of how you stack your trade your trade calls there. Um we can get through this one real quick. Abzi, I don't think the Bulls are rebuilding from their point of view. So if you're asking how they should rebuild, they're uh, not. If they hurt their leverage. I don't <laughs> they think came they came out be- and said they're not. <laughs> I don't believe they believe that. So again, you have to put yourself in the shoes of the decision makers who are in positions of power, not um, with our fan hats or whatever. Um, 
Vincent asks a, a question about basically how do teams coordinate around a new CBA to know the you know where things are going and strategy. And I'll just say that like some are do more of uh, intel gathering than others in terms of talking to the NBA, talking to the MBPA, talking to whoever might have some information and maybe do a better job of anticipating where things might go. Uh, when we had the 26, this is not a CBA relation uh, related question or answer rather, but like when the Celtics saw the TV deal kicking in, everybody spent crazy money and they didn't. They spent money on like really short, non mostly non-guaranteed in the second year deals. Was it Tyler Zeller or Cody Zeller or one of the Zellers or something like that? Um, and they didn't do the Mozgovs and they didn't do the the um, Joakim Noah or the Mahinmis or the the long list of bad contracts. So that doesn't 100% address the CBA, but that addresses understanding the trends and where things are going. And sometimes teams can get ahead of it. And sometimes no matter how hard you try, you can't. So uh, the last part of your question says, how do you have a trade deadline strategy so it's close to foolproof? The answer is that's just not, this is not possible. Like it's really, you make the best decision with the information that you have that everyone can live with. And a lot of times it's from choosing from options that you don't like. So it might even be the, the, the least offensive option. All right. And then Bobby, I just want to wrap this up here. Um, uh, Christopher does ask a question. I don't think we're going to get into right now. Uh, Christopher reach out to us privately on Twitter, the questions about insurance policies and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that that's kind of out of the scope of today. It is a good question. Yeah. Um, but we're going to skip that one. No offense. Reach out. We were happy to answer it later. Uh, and then ATZ does ask a, a, a good question. Um, thank you for all the questions uh, from you and from everybody else. Uh, but this is the last one we'll answer. Do uh, do you think you'll ever create a set of tools to allow people to run mock off seasons or mock trade deadlines among their own friends, social groups beyond the immersive, basically, in Vegas as uh he's been using or they have been using Google Sheets and it's a lot of work. So um, I know that Sports Business Classroom, we're always looking for new ideas and new programs. And I have a, a software development background and a lot of fun tools that I work on. So I, I would not say uh, that it's actively in, in, in plans, but it's a great idea. And uh, you know, sign up for SBC. Maybe you can help us spearhead that next year. So, uh, uh, but yeah, I think that's it. Uh, Bobby, you want to answer this Benjamin one? Yeah, uh, I mean, if, how to if reach anybody us? has any questions, you can send me emails at rmarks0709 at gmail.com. I will uh, do my best to get back to you if you send me CBA-related questions. I just put my email in the chat. I am happy to answer. Just give me a little bit of time to uh live my life and uh, handle all of my responsibilities. Uh, for instance, I need to go to the Clipper game, I think, and then I'll be flying to Indiana for the all-star game in, in a few days. So, uh, but Bobby, it's always a pleasure. Eric, uh, always a pleasure. Safe travels to uh, all-star weekend, my friend. Indiana. I've actually never been to Indiana, so I'm looking forward to it. Great city. Terrific. Yeah. All right. I'm looking forward to it. So, uh, just a reminder, basketball, business of basketball, uh, immersive experience. Uh, Jordan, do you want to pull up that that first slide again? Uh, just so that the people on the way out can just remember uh, where to sign up. Uh, space is limited. Um, like, I'm not a salesperson, Bobby. We're not, this is not, we're not, we're not salespeople. We're, we're more function people, right? So we're not sitting here and saying, oh, you got to sign up quick and all that. Like, the reality is, is it sells out. And so if you want to be a part of it, signing up earlier is better. And then there is a discount uh, if you sign up via early bird registration. So like, why wouldn't you want to sign up early to guarantee your spot and to save money? So if you're going to do it, do it early. Um, these are all the details. Uh, Bob, you have any last thoughts? No. Uh, enjoy uh, All-Star break. Everyone out there, get away from basketball for a little while, and then we get the stretch run. It will be the playoffs in no time here. So uh, if you're a team in the Western Conference, uh, buckle up, man. It's going to get uh, pretty exciting here. But uh, but everyone stay safe out there. 
Oh, I do believe that this should be viewable later via the same link. Yeah. So it, it'll take a minute. So I we usually get a question. Uh, my friend missed this. They want to watch it. Or if you want to rewatch, it should be viewable at the same link that you came here. It just, they may need a uh, certain of our staff, uh, our great staff at SBC uh, and Hall Pass probably need a little bit of time uh, to, I don't know, upload stuff. Uh, but yes, it will be shared again as well. So thank you so much, Bobby. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Eric. And there you have it, my friends. I hope you enjoyed our 100th episode. If you did, make sure to share it with your friends, post it on social media, and subscribe and review. Let us know you listened, and if you enjoyed the episode, tag us on your IG story at Sports Business Classroom. Let us know that you're listening and what you thought about this episode. And finally, text it to a friend and spread the message of getting better every day. This episode is also brought to you by Hall Pass Media, a full-service marketing agency that specializes in brand consulting, event management, digital marketing, and creative design. For more information on Hall Pass Media, go to hallpassnetwork.com. That's hallpassnetwork.com.